Great. Well, I guess I'm going to start off. I won't start off into this presentation quite yet. I, I will tell you what I do, because some of you might scratch your head as what, what's the single point of contact for industrial frac sand in Wisconsin. Um, I, I do a lot of speaking like this. I work with the counties and the townships. Uh, I work with the developers and the consultants. I'm able to set up uh, pre-application meetings. If you're thinking about having a mine or a processing plant or a new one, you can contact me and I can, we, you know, we can bring you in, we can sit down, we can go over the, your project, what permits are required. Once you get into kind of the permitting process, I can help if things are appear to getting stuck or if the lines of communication between you and us aren't working. I can kind of expedite things and facilitate things. I do most of the media contacts, so Deb does some of them, but I do most all of the media contacts and I talk to a ton of angry people every day that don't like the frac sand industry and I try to explain to them what really is the truth and what isn't. So that's kind of what I do there. Um, in the back on the table, I brought along a whole roll of uh, spill notification stickers for you guys, your mine operators, and take as many as you want, put them up in your work shacks or even on your piece of equipment. Uh, it is required that if you do have spills, they report them, and there's some de minimis quantities. You gotta clean up your spills irregardless, but if you spill over more than five gallons of oil or hydraulic fluid, it's a reportable spill spill more than a gallon of gasoline, it's a reportable spill. That's the number that you call and it's manned 24 hours a day, so please take as many of those as you like. We have one geologist, uh, or not geologist, one archeologist uh, in the Department of Natural Resources. His name is Mark Dudzik. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here today and he asked me to, to give this presentation. I know a little bit about all the, everything that we do with frac sand mines and industrial mining in the DNR, uh, but I'm not a Mark Dudzik and I'm not a Dave Johnson or a Jeff Johnson. Uh, you can always call me for those type of questions. But today I'm gonna try to hit on the, the archeological issues. Uh, studies indicate that nearly 80% of the archeological sites that once existed in the state of Wisconsin have been destroyed or damaged. Um, I was working a few years back with a company called Urco. They're the largest chloralkali plant in the world. They're located in Port Edwards and they were going through a big, big conversion where we were dealing with permits and expansions as they tried to get the mercury out of their process, which they did. At that time, they were the largest mercury emitter in the state of Wisconsin. And in the process, we got an archeological hit on the area that they wanted to expand in of, of, of burial, Indian burial grounds. And we said, oh no, what's, what does this mean? So after working with Mark Dudzik, we got into it a little bit more and reviewed it. Turns out that in 1911, the circus came to town and they flattened the effigy mound for the big top. And that was the end of it, so it wasn't a concern. So even that long ago, we were, you know, these sites were being destroyed. Here's kind of our uh, review process. It's mandatory, we do this for all projects, very similar to what DC explained for the, for the endangered threatened species database with the map with sites on it. Uh, that are identified as historical or archeological sites. Uh, this review doesn't assure that no archeological or historical resources exist on the site, it's just that they're not listed. If potential archeological or historical resources are discovered, activity should cease. Now that doesn't mean it has to cease. If, uh, if it's not listed and you do your due diligence and it turns up like you've got pottery shards or arrowheads you could continue and still be in compliance with the law. We wish you would con contact us, but you're not required to, with the exception of human remains. If you start turning up skeletons and skulls and stuff, and, and this has not happened, you better stop on a dime uh, and, and call us. You can call me or you can call Mark Dudzig, but you should be contacting us and then avoiding the area. We have had uh, one, US Silica down in Sparta uh, had had some issues. Uh, we worked with them. They actually got a they snow fenced off the, the area of concern. Uh, they got an archaeologist in there to assess the value of the what we were looking at. And nine out of ten times, uh, there's not going to be any value to these these artifacts. And in this case, there wasn't. And they were able to continue on. Uh, if you if you take away anything from these pre presentation is don't be scared of this. You know, if you run into it. 
we will work with you. Uh, it's not like you're going to stop your whole project and everything's going to come to a halt and you're going to have all your equipment there. You might have to avoid an area for a while, but it's not, it, it's not a showstopper. It doesn't have to be a showstopper. And there's Mark Dudzik's uh, contact information there. That's kind of a poor, that's Mark Dudzik. No, no, it's, it's, it's not Mark Dudzik. It's actually the, probably the uh, archeologist that we all best know, uh, Indiana Jones. It's kind of a history, it's an interesting history we have in the state of Wisconsin. And it, ten, about 10,000 years ago, um, the glaciers were retreating from Wisconsin and the climate was warming and we had woolly mammoths and mastodons here and bison and indigenous people moved in and they chased these animals around. They were very mobile and uh, it, you know, they ate nuts and berries, they were gatherers, but they moved all over the place. About 8,000 years ago, climate started to warm up a bit. The mastodons and woolly mammoths, they were all gone. We had the, you know, the animals we have now, the elk and the deer. Uh, they began to hunt them. They lived in small family groups about 3,000 years ago called the Woodland Period. Uh, they started to uh, make small villages and they lived in caves and, and uh, shelters typically along rivers. This is a time when they created the effigy mounds uh, that we see now uh, in parks and things that are in the shape of turtles and, and bears and, and uh, birds and other wildlife. And then about a thousand years ago, they started to sell, settle in big villages and uh, actually you know, started gardening and started potting pots. Uh, they actually had a tremendous and unbelievable trade network that went both to the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans and it were quite sophisticated. So these people left you know, stuff behind as where they lived and I'm, I'm not an archeologist, but I really do like old stuff. There is an effigy. Now, if you're looking for a place to site a sand mine, if you see something like this, move on. It wouldn't be a good idea. Or if you see a cave nearby with you know, rock paintings on it, wouldn't be a good idea. If you see this, this would be a very poor spot to site one. This is actually Frank's Hill, someplace in southern Wisconsin. More typical, you're gonna run into arrowheads if you run into anything. Uh, tools that they use fashioned out of stone, pottery shards, Rose, another pottery shard. There's, rather than Indiana Jones, that's probably more typical of what you're going to see in, in modern day archaeology. Very painstaking. I would think it's very boring to ship, sift through dirt and look at pottery shards, but uh, there are people that do it. Here are the laws, the state statutes. Um, I'm not going to read all these to you. These are going to be available on the website, so I'm going to kind of breeze through these state projects. This is why we have to review, uh, because we have a permitting status. We're granting a permit. This is why DNR does the review. Uh, Mark Dudzik will work very closely also with the Wisconsin Historical Society and the archaeologists there on any issues that come up. That's on public lands, federal lands political subdivisions, burial sites. Again, do, you know, stop on a dime if you hit something like this. I mean, this really would be, this, if, if, you, if you went ahead, more than likely news would get out, some equipment operator would say, you know, we got skulls and we hit stuff. Uh, you know, the tribes might get involved and it would quickly get very, very messy if you were found to be violating this rule. So that's the one takeaway. You know, hit any bones, any skeletons, any skulls, stop on a dime, contact us. This isn't a showstopper. We can work through these issues. Nobody that I know of in the sand industry has ever had this happen, so it's, it's probably pretty unlikely. But more statutes, rock art sites, public lands, laws and statutes. Some good information here. Uh, there's a good website they have you can go to for resources, and you can always contact Mark Dudzik. I know some of the uh, some of the uh, mining companies, some of the consultants have already contacted him. There's actually some of the consultants that have archaeologists on on staff. They, some of them have them on retainer. 
you know, if you, if you had a site and you really wanted to do your due diligence, you could do a phase one, you could do a review of what might be out there, and if there was something there, you could actually get an archaeologist in there to do uh, digging in areas that, that, you know, they think there might be, you might find something in. So that's going to give us a little bit of time on our agenda. Is, is there questions on this that people might have? Okay. No questions? Deb, we've got a little, I freed up a little time here. Oh, one. On the website, is that, is that similar to the environmental review where uh, it's, you can't get at everything just a little bit or is it you're gonna, public you're gonna, the sites? Are yeah, you're going to see the, the, the sites on there, but you're not going to know what they are. Okay. And they're not going to tell you what they are. Yeah. Well, no, no, actually the historical sites will be like things like old mills and old buildings and stuff, uh, those will be listed right on there by county, the historical sites, but the archeological sites won't. Unlikely that you're gonna hit a historic, I, the only thing I could think of is, you know, if you bought a piece of land in the country and there was a 150 year old beautiful Lutheran church there and you were gonna demolish it, that might be a historical site. But for the most part, the buildings that you're gonna be dealing with even if you purchase old farm sites, they're not going to be on the historical register. Old sites. Pardon? Old sites. Some of them are and some of them aren't. Yeah. 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 You might. Jim just said you might run into a, a you know an old school country school site that has historical value and is listed. But again, if they're not listed you know, you, you're not required to deal with them if they're not listed on, on the website as a historical site. My name is Brad Johnson. Um, I've been doing stormwater for about 15 years out of Wausau. Um, and have been doing uh, frack stuff since it sort of began over this way. Um, my first frack site was uh, Badger Mine up in Hickson, just a little ways from here. Um, I'm going to be tag teaming this with one of my colleagues from La Crosse. Um, the non-metallic mining operations permit is a combo permit. It's a, it's a wastewater permit and a stormwater permit. She's going to cover the wastewater section, and I'll cover the stormwater requirements uh, to start out. So I said it was a general permit, um, I think. Um, this permit is the same permit. This non-metallic mining operations permit is the same permit that everybody in the state gets. If they're mining topsoil, if they're mining granite, if they're mining um, sand, if they're mining clay, it doesn't matter. Um, it could be a mom and pop with a one acre mine or it could be, you know, some of you guys represented in this room with hundreds of acres under, uh, you know, in a mine. So um, as a one permit fits all kind of scenario, there are some nuances to it that uh, we'll talk a little bit about right now. So um, I talked about this a little bit and it's pretty much everybody engaged in the excavation or processing of sand, gravel, and everything else. And then we, we also say other similar activities. Um, we have some of the big processing facilities, or at least I do, um, that aren't mining anything out of the ground covered under the non-metallic mining operations permit. Uh, yeah. Better? It's, it's, this, it's this one, it needs to be up closer to you. All right. And then look at the screen up there. So stop doing that? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Very helpful. All right, so um, like I, I was saying that we have other facilities um, not mining covered under this permit uh, because we rope them in under this other similar um, activities uh, language. Um, and it's the best, most convenient way to uh, make that happen. It's the best fit. 
So the process, let me talk a little bit about that because you know we're all about the process. Um, I hope not. Uh, there's a notice of intent. It's a really brief application um, stating what your intended activities are going to be. Um, most folks take some literally five minutes to fill out. Uh, where the rubber meets the road though is in this next section, this detailed stormwater pollution prevention plan. Um, this is the thing that we um, scrutinize uh, above all else. Um, as part of that process, we're going to look at the notice of intent um, and then we're going to screen for archaeological historical sites, Tom talked about that, and endangered and threatened resources and wetlands. Um, we can't um, press hard enough um, or encourage you enough to get those two things taken care of on the front end when and if at all possible, especially the endangered and threatened resources thing. Um, you heard Anna and Lisi talk about the, the Carner Blue time frame and um, that can literally push you back, like Lisi said, I think a year. Um, and the sooner you know what you have going on on the property, the, the better off uh, you can move forward to make good choices. Should you choose not to go through the Endangered Resources Bureau on the front end, you may be left going through them anyway on the back end. Because our process during the screening is to uh, essentially try to figure out um, whether there's a hit. And we have only a macro view. We don't, um, us in the field don't have the same level of access as the endangered resources folks. So if there is a hit, we by and large have to end up sending you as the applicant to endangered resources anyway. So you might as well have started with them. Um, hope that makes sense. Um, same thing happens with archeological historical. If we get a hit, we pretty much, the timeline for permit approval and review pretty much ends, and we send you to uh, an archeologist to get things cleared up. Wetlands, we can deal with as a water of the state. We'll take care of that. Um, lastly, we'll review the pollution prevention plan for the applicable elements, and we'll talk about that now. So the biggest thing on the stormwater end is, um, at non-metallic mines, is keeping dirt where it belongs. It's kind of the same mantra that we would use at any big construction site, or any construction site um, for that matter. So we're looking at identification of BMPs, short-term and permanent erosion control. Short-term would be uh, silt fence while you're getting something shaped and, and seeded. Uh, permanent erosion control would be a perimeter berm, something like that. We want to know about phasing. You know, where are you going to start? Where are you going to move your operations to? How are you going to handle water as you move through those different phases? Very important that we have an implementation schedule. When are you going to do, when are you going to put in silt fence? When are you going to do the perimeter berms? When are you going to do the other um, stormwater control BMPs and things like that? We want to have drawings, figures. We want, you know, the days of sending in an application or a plan on, a, on the back of a napkin or, or on a one piece of one sheet of paper, long gone. We're looking for some pretty sophisticated stuff here, I think. Um, we want to know about water resources. This program is about water quality and protection of that resource. So we want to know where the water resources are on your site, where are they proximal, where, where might you be impacting waters of the state. Um, details about the processing area. We recognize that a lot of times mine uh, infrastructure development happens before the processing kind of thing is figured out and we can work with that. Um, but we will ultimately want details on the processing area. Uh, and then rail, um, whether it's on site or off site, we'll want to deal with that. Okay, so these are, this is uh, my soapbox, I guess, for these pollution prevention plants. Um, we want them to be pretty sophisticated. They should be uh, equivalent to a plan set that we would, uh, that somebody would prepare for a construction site. Very detail oriented, topo, uh, water flow, drainage, I mean, everything. We want a, a good plan. Um, there should be a narrative portion that details um, the whens and wheres of erosion control, where they're gonna be implemented, how they're gonna be maintained. And then, um, you know, on that plan set, we want to know where specifically the BMPs are going to go. There's lots of details in the permit. There's lots of details in NR216, the code that covers this on required elements in a plan, but these are kind of the biggies. 
Um, one of the questions that we get a lot is, when do I update this plan? I, I submit it before I break ground, and my project has morphed you know, six months later into this something completely different. The pollution prevention plan, the stormwater pollution prevention plan, is, you know, call it a living document, call it whatever you will, it needs to be updated almost constantly. What I've been recommending to my facilities is that they prepare the plan once, they, as it morphs and changes throughout the construction season, they make notes, they, they make a spot at the end of a three ring binder where they add in stuff that they've changed or they're doing differently, and then through the winter, they update their plan and, and get it up to date. Um, you're required to do this in the permit and in code when expansion, production increases, process modifications, changes in material handling, or storage occur. That pretty much covers everybody all the time. Um, another time when you're required to do it is when there's an increase in exposure of pollutants or a need for a significant modifications to the BMPs. Um, that may or may not happen regularly, but um, oftentimes. The catch-all, the one that uh, helps me sleep at night, uh, is that whenever the department tells you to. <laughs> so um, that's, that's basically when we see something that may or may not have been, well, that typically would have been missed in your plan, that gives us the ability to say, hey, listen, that area of your plan that wasn't addressed, uh, or, or in your project that wasn't addressed in your plan needs to be updated so that that area of exposure, that area that's contributing sediment to waters of the state needs to get taken care of. So um, that's sort of the catch-all for us. So um, shockingly, there's a monitoring component to this permit. Um, it's not as, uh, it's not very arduous, actually. Um, Brad, I got a question on your stormwater pollution prevention. Yeah. Um, if you actually, if, if every year, you know, obviously at the wintertime is when things are slowing down. If the company goes through and they go through and they say, we've expanded, we don't see any changes, an email to you is not a bad thing. And you don't mind getting an email from the company saying, you know, we've reviewed it and there's no changes or small changes. And that, that, then you've got a record that at least they're looking at it. Um, from an enforcement point of view, I would think the enforcement people would, you know, that would be looked at favorably that they're looking at it on a regular basis. Yeah, I would say anytime um, that more communication is better than less, and that would be a perfect case in point. And almost always, I would say that the, the areas uh, that are opened up would change in a year. So that, at the very least, I think you can count on updating your, your drainage base map or your, or your um, site layout. Um, but beyond that, yeah, just a heads up, that's perfect. I had all my facilities do that this winter, give me updated plans. So that worked out really well. So as far as monitoring goes under the permit, you have to inspect your stormwater controls once per quarter. Um, this is in the pollution prevention plan uh, requirements section. Um, and, and basically that's, it's kind of a full brush look at how everything is, is laid out. Is it all run into this place where you expect it to go? Is it all run in the way it's supposed to? Um, and that needs to be documented. There's a, you can make up your own form, but there's language in the permit that lays out specifically uh, what's required in that inspection. Um, and then you have to do a visual check of runoff within 60 minutes of a significant rainfall event. That's a quarterly requirement as well. Um, and then there's language in the permit that lays out specifically what that visual check is supposed to do. Uh, there's an annual facility site compliance inspection and report. Um, it's really goofy. We require one, you know, an annual inspection, um, even though most of the mine operators are on site, you know, pretty much every day. Um, that's not a huge deal. That's that check, that annual facility site compliance inspection is your um, your certification essentially that the pollution prevention plan is still adequate to cover your site. So that's, that's where you cover your backside that everything is still up to, up to speed. Okay, resource considerations. These are the monkey wrenches that get thrown into the usual um, smooth permitting that we experience. Um, if somebody's proposing discharges to uh, 303 delisted water, that's uh, the impaired waters uh, in Wisconsin. An ORW or ERW, that's outstanding resource water and exceptional resource water, or a wetland, or to a waterway that has a TMDL, um, it kind of kicks in some additional requirements. Um, 
Specifically, ORW, ERWs are the cold water resources, the trout streams. So they have a higher level of protection typically and will require more of an effort on your pollution prevention planning activities. Uh, and that higher level of effort means pretty much not discharging. So um, that's something for you to be aware of. 303D listed waters and TMDLs are probably on the same list. Um, those are, uh, the nuance to those is if your discharge contributes to the impairment of the water body for the reason it's listed, um, then you'll have to undertake some uh, additional, uh, re additional steps to clean up your, your discharge. So if we have a waterway that's on the 303D list for sediment, um, your ability to discharge sediment, whether through your wastewater discharge or your stormwater discharge, will be scrutinized. So, and wetlands, uh, kind of the same thing. Um, we're required to uh, pay attention, like all of our programs, to NR103. And so if a discharge is proposed to a wetland that could conceivably change the functional value of that wetland, um, we have to talk uh, about that discharge. So and typically we would seek to avoid and minimize uh, that, that situation with the wetland. Okay, so not everything runs smoothly at these sites. Um, folks get ahead of themselves. I just put down sort of a laundry list of some of the big, uh, I don't know, the, the frequent flyer kind of uh, violations that we've had in the, in the recent past. Um, the big ones, failure to implement your pollution prevention plan, failure to maintain your plan, failure to update or amend your plan. Um, and these last two are more related to the wastewater side of things. It's the duty to halt or reduce activity. This is in NR 205 of the code. It's a standard requirement in all of our wastewater discharge permits. But it, it essentially requires that if you realize that you're discharging not in compliance with your permit, you have to stop your discharge or reduce your discharge to the point where you're not contributing to a water quality impairment again. Um, hard to get a facility. Uh, we've, we haven't had a lot of success with folks going, whoa, we had this major problem and we stopped because time is money. So that's, uh, we've had a number of enforcement conferences on that and had to pursue enforcement on a few others. Um, failure to notify is the other one. Um, we won't get a contact from a facility that they maybe had a catastrophic discharge where um, we had one where they had a floating pump or uh, their intake was on floats and it broke loose, went right to the bottom of their sediment pond and started slurping sediment. Well, that happened sometime during the night. They didn't show up till the next morning and so for 10 hours the thing had been slurping mud off the bottom of the pond um, and turned the Black River chocolatey brown for 11 miles. Um, they didn't tell us about it. <laughs> um, the warden got the calls first on the hotline. So um, they're required to notify us. That led to some enforcement on our part. We just ended up doing citations in that case, but um, those are some of the issues that we're running across. All right, so I talked about the non-metallic mining operations permit. One of the other permits, uh, stormwater permits, that you may uh, need to get uh, would be a construction permit. It's for land disturbances in excess of one acre. Um, it requires an erosion control plan. It requires post-construction stormwater management. Um, where we've required these at mining sites or ancillary to mining sites is uh, processing areas, uh, rail sites, sometimes infrastructure improvements like um, Maybe the, the mine gets fully developed and then somebody comes along and says, oh, we want a new access off of a, this different county road or to avoid road bans, we're going to a state road. Um, that is irrespective of the mine site um, and is handled under this construction site permit. Um, this I didn't put a lot of um, information on to slides or anything, but this one is, um, the hard part for most folks to get through is the post-construction stormwater management. Um, that requires peak flow control, it, can, it requires TSS control to 80% and requires infiltration. Um, so what I would say is um, hire some professional help to get through that part of the process. 
Uh, and I'm not going to say any more about that unless anybody has any questions. All right, just some examples here. I'm just going to burn through a few slides here of um, some sites where um, some erosion control would have been a good thing. Uh, or they had erosion control, but we had, this was a weekend uh, last May where we had eight inches of rain in three days. So uh, big site, lots of country opened up. Uh, I'm going to go back to that last one. Uh, there's a waterway. Uh, down the left side of the screen there. Uh, it's got rock in it. Uh, they stabilized the, the bottom with uh, geotextile, but there was so much flow, it just blew right through there. Big site again. Uh, here's the thing, uh, about a month later, the sides had been uh, stabilized. Uh, mulch had been crimped, been seeded down. Still too wet. This is before things dried out. Um, this is a good example. They put in um, silt fence first. This is a big swath of countryside that's been silt fenced, but then this uh, area to the right is a humongous perimeter berm. Uh, the thing's 20 feet tall, I think. It's really, really nice. It provides the facility some. Um, uh, you know, an obstruction or a, a way to, um, I guess, protect people along the highway from seeing the site. Um, and so it looks like uh, nice and green there. Works really well. Keeps everything internal. Uh, this is a site where um, the plan called for a perimeter berm to protect adjacent wetlands. And this is all the overburden and stuff uh, in the wetland. Um, this one is uh, actually a wastewater thing that I just thought was uh, kind of fun because uh, sometimes this, I guess I file under the what in the world were they thinking category. Um, the pipe with the water coming out of it, that's their discharge into their sedimentation pond. And then the black pipe uh, to the left of there is uh, the outlet. Oops. So they're about maybe seven feet apart. So. The volume of that pond isn't being used to mitigate the suspended solids. It's basically going in there and then going eight feet to the outlet pipe and out and to this river. So I think that's all I had. Questions? Just one question on that one acre. Obviously, if a farmer, if it wasn't for a construction site, farmer could be grubbing out trees or doing whatever he would want without a permit for farming. Is that right? For agriculture, it's exempt, yes. Oh. Uh, now, for construction sites, when you talk about the post construction design, one of the things that I know Ruth ran to up north was uh, not designing for sediment runoff during the construction, but the ponds were designed for ones that would have been vegetated. So it's the need to look at both during construction and post construction. Yeah, so we typically have two suites of best management practices. There's there's a suite that's that you would use during construction. It's the typical stuff you see all the time. It's silt fence, it might be bales, it could be um, sediment traps, stuff like that. Whereas post-construction, um, the primary thing you see out in the countryside is wet ponds. Um, and sometimes they can function, or, or the, the space can function as the same thing, but we typically think of a sediment trap or something like that as something not exactly engineered. It doesn't have an outfall or an outlet on it that's been designed to release water at a rate that, that we would desire. So um, yeah, they're, they're, they're two different things typically, um, and you need to account for the volume uh, when you have a big chunk of country opened up like that. So, yes? Uh, could you talk a little bit, we've got some people here from the conference of various county, but the interaction between the reclamation plan, maybe you're doing a later grab, it's a reclamation plan from the chaps of 30 point of view, and the reclamation plan from the county uh, that takes place when you've got a site along the river <coughs> or a half mile by water. Let's talk about that in an hour. We'll talk about that yeah. in an hour. All right. Yeah. Stay tuned.
Other questions? So as Brad mentioned to you earlier, um, this is kind of a catch-all permit uh, for both wastewater and for stormwater. So when an industrial sand facility gets its permit, um, it's also being covered for process wash waters. Um, it was decided many years ago that uh, the stormwater program would be administering the wastewater side of things as well. So for the sources of the process wash water, we want to take a look at the sand washing operations. Um, some of those can come to you as an open loop system where there's a single pass through and then discharge or a closed loop system in which water is being recycled back, treated and then run back through the process again. We will also look at dewatering operations that take place in separating the solids from the treated process and then also drainage from the washed sand piles. We look at two types of drainage where this is concerned, and this is a little bit different, maybe a little bit confusing under the permit process. Uh, for process wash water, it's considered a wastewater, so there are a discharge to a surface water that we would examine and a discharge to groundwater that's a little bit different when we're looking at stormwater discharges. Stormwater discharges in a facility that's trying to be internally drained will try to hold and seep into the ground all stormwater for a 10-year, 24-hour rain event. Those are not monitored um, other than through looking at making sure that the, the uh, practices for, main, for infiltrating that into the ground are continuing to perform. When we are looking at the process wash water, um, discharges to groundwater are monitored. So now I'm going to take you through a series of uh, photographs that kind of example for you one type of process system. Um, onto the left side of the picture, you will see a washed pile of sand that is waiting for drying and sorting. And it will come off of the conveyor system. The conveyor system here is depositing sand into the piles, but the sand is wet. And, and in many situations at some of the facilities, water is dripping off the conveyor belts. So we want to take a look at where that process wash water is headed. This would be a typical wash closed loop system. Um, as you can see here that there's a series of pipes. This one here would represent clear water that is being pumped up into the system and through the towers that would do the sorting of the process, then the return water coming down out of the tower would contain fine materials that would need to be separated out before the water could then be returned back into the system again. That would be a closed loop system. <clears throat> In this particular facility, they decided to separate the solids by taking them through a series of treatment tanks. The tank in the back is a typical clarifier in which chemical addition is being uh, added to the, to the basin to aid the solids from sep uh, separating from the water and settling down to the bottom of the tank. Clear water then goes over a typical weir or um, baffle and would be collected into this tank here for holding and drawing back into the process again. Some of the chemicals that we have been seeing used in this process include a liquid coagulant. Um, this would be a typical ready-to-use product that would be hooked up to the system and dosed in through a metering pump. A polymer day tank is typical for a dry polymer. Um, this would be a situation where a large super sack would be positioned above the tank. Um, the tank would then be filled with water, mixer turned on, and a s amount of polymer would be added to the tank and activated for use. This would be something that would be done every day. For separating the solids out, um, you can see that this facility chose to use a plate and frame filter press. And the, s the sludge that comes off the bottom of the uh, clarifier would then be fed into the center of the plate and frame press and forced through with uh, high pressure pumps 
and into chambers that exist between each of the plates. This essentially squeezes the water out of the solid mixture and falls through the small series of pipes into a trough, which then gets returned back into the process. Sometimes uh, facilities will choose to do a different type of solid separation. Rather than doing a treatment tank and, and chemical addition, what they'll do is they'll do an inline chemical addition, which would then transfer all of the wastewater to a settling pond. Then clear water would come off the pond and be returned back into the process. So then we want to consider uh, the washed sand piles themselves. When you take a look at a freshly washed uh, pile of sand coming off the conveyor system, uh, they're going to be resting uh, for a period of time while waiting for the drying process to take place. In here, you can see maybe two or three small black pipes. This is a weeper pipe that is coming from the bottom of the sand piles as collected water and is conveying it somewhere. We want to take a look at where that somewhere is going. Um, in this particular instance, the drainage coming from the pipes is picking up sediment in the surrounding area and is creating a significant amount of sediment going along with the drainage. Um, at this point, I'd like to point out that many times we are enc encountering uh, this process drainage from sand piles uh, going into stormwater ponds. And this can be very tricky because if a facility is trying to keep and maintain internal drainage status and has a stormwater pond that is designed to hold and contain a 10-year rain event, um, process wash water like this can quickly alter that pond's ability to be able to hold that rain event. Also, the other thing you want to consider is the fact that now you're commingling process wash water with storm water. And now all of the parameters that have been set forth in Brad's discussion on stormwater monitoring and maintenance is out the window because it's now being treated all as process wash water because it's commingled. So when we're taking a look at the process water systems, if we're, whether you're choosing a mechanical system or a settling basin, you want to have a good maintenance schedule put together for this. It will keep the function of the system at optimized levels. It will reduce breaches of any systems that are getting um, uh, filled with sediment in the basins. Uh, they'll also require some monitoring that will have to go with it. And ultimately, a discharge monitoring report will have to be submitted to the department every year. Um, so by doing your good maintenance on it, you can avoid your settling basin from looking something like this. Uh, where in this particular facility, the basin filled completely and um, sand from off the surface of the settling basin is being caught by wind and being blown. When we look at process wash waters, uh, discharges to surface waters, um, whether it be a stormwater pond combined with process wash waters or a separate process wash water pond, if it discharges and leads directly to a surface water of the state, and that could be a, a lake, a river, a uh, stream, or wetland, <clears throat> these are the types of things that are going to need to be monitored for. We want to have um, a tracking, if you will, an estimate of the discharge flow that is occurring on a daily basis uh, and monitored once per quarter. When you take a look at the permit, this is under the uh, general permit section four, I mean, sorry, section five. Um, the estimations is that anything below 200,000 gallons per day uh, is well within the means of the quarterly monitoring. If you exceed 200,000 gallons per day, we want to see monthly monitoring taking place. Um, it is an estimate, so this is going to be such where you're going to need to know the capacity of your pond, the discharge levels, the active um, water level, and the size of the pipes, those types of things to help you get the best estimate for discharge. Um, give us the number of days in which you have discharged from the pond. Um, and just record that. Um, we want to also monitor for suspended solids. Uh, because this is a process wash water, it now has a surface 
water quality level to look at, and that's the 40 milligrams per liter. Um, that is also a quarterly monitoring. If it exceeds 40 milligrams per liter, we ask now to have that frequency increased to a monthly monitoring. pH levels between six and nine, uh, and that is something that is an annual monitoring. However, if the P pH is seen to go below six or above nine, that would now need to go to a quarterly monitoring. Now, on the subject of pH, I believe that earlier this morning um, there was a discussion about metals being mobilized. Um, there have been a couple of uh, facilities in which we've been concerned because pH has indeed dropped below 6. And at that level, you begin to see mobilization of metals into the surface waters. Oil and grease is one of those um, special parameters. We want to see uh, once per year on this if the, um, if the oil and grease exceeds 15 milligrams per liter, then we would like to see an increase on that as well to a quarterly. If it is below 7.5, then you're pretty much done. Um, one test is all we need on that. I haven't had any uh, real issues with any facilities exceeding um, or even getting above detection limits. It's not something that I typically am um, concerned about with process wash waters. Discharges to groundwater, slightly different animal. Um, now we're not going to be so much interested in suspended solids testing because it's all going to be contained and anything is being discharged to the bottom of the pond. Uh, the permit in section four here um, will indicate that monitoring the sediment levels of the basin um, would probably be required so that you could monitor the effective performance of the pond to be able to have discharge to the groundwater. We also would like to see an estimate of discharge on a daily basis reported on a quarterly monitoring. Um, it's not that we're looking for you to report every single day's volume, but to have a day in which you are monitoring in that quarter and then give us the day, number of days. Um, with with uh, discharge to groundwater is pretty much every, every day anyways. Um, we ask that uh, we have you keep a record of the water treatment additives. Um, these are the polymers that are being added. Um, we'd like to see your monthly usage. Um, some facilities have given it to us in the number of gallons that have been used. I'd like to give you a little bit of a, a polymer chemistry 101 lesson, if you will. Um, there's a lot of mystery around polymers and a lot of misunderstanding. Um, and then there's also not a lot of information out there. Um, we're taking a look at the use of polymers uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. The department has an approved polymer list for the application of stormwater and erosion control, but not so much for process wash waters. Um, so what we would want to do when we do look at the use of polymers in the process water treatment, um, we would like to see the MSDS uh, for the product that you plan on using to have toxicity information. That will give us a pretty good estimation uh, as to how much of a recommendation we can give you for um, application rates. I'd like to mention that Polymers that are listed with NSF certified products, that's the uh, National Sanitation Foundation, uh, they have taken a look at polymers as it relates to drinking water standards. Um, they have a huge list on their website. You can Google them and find their probably 400 page long list of products that they've certified. They tend to have the least amount of residual acrylamides available in them, and I'll explain the importance of that in a minute. Um, Kate Gleason, who is here today, um, she is going to be the one who will review and take a look at the products that you are interested in using, and she can give you some guidance um, and our recommendations for approval. Given that now, I want to clear up some of the fuzziness with it. Um, whenever you ask about polyacrylamides in particular, you'll find that the general response from most manufacturers is that they are proprietary ingredients and they're not willing to share their chemistry information with you. 
If you take a look at them, you'll note that most of them, many of them, are rated non-hazardous, and that's for DOT and transportation purposes, not necessarily for toxicity information. When you look at the MSDS seats, you'll find that they don't give you much help in understanding some of that. So what's the secret formula? Well, most everybody knows that you start with dirty water on the left and you end up with clean water on the right. So how does it work? <clears throat> These next three slides are kind of, um, they're taken from text material, so there's some notes in the margin on one of them, and they're a little bit crooked, so I apologize for, for unclear uh, conditions here, but I will try my best to explain. Um, polymers will do a process of solid separation, so you have dirty water in there, they will create what's called a flock, or the process of flocculation. In this example, these are the solid particles that make up the dirty water or the sands and the silts and the fine particles that need to be separated out of the water in the process. The positive charges are the polymers that are being introduced into the waste stream for treatment. They first start by destabilizing any colloid formations, and I realize that that's technical terminology, but basically it just makes it easy for things to happen. Then the polymers go in and form bridges in between the particles, and they begin to collect one on top of the other and create an agglomeration. That is the flock formation. Many people don't know what an acrylamide really is and how it's made. So in this slide, we start with an acrylamide monomer. And this is the one in which I think most people are very sensitive to. These are the polymers. The acrylamides are the ones that are, they break down in ultraviolet radiation. They move through the water table. They are toxic to um, most aquatic animals. Um, these are combined with a very fancy uh, monomer, uh, M MAPTAC is kind of what it's co uh, collectively known. The big name is all down here, and if you don't mind, I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Under, uh, and, and my notes up here say that they're equal ratios, or one ratio to one ratio, so they're going in equal amounts. Under industrial conditions of high heat and high pressure, um, a, a cationic polymer is created. This is the long chain carbon backbone of the polymer, and each one of these forms a branch that has a charge. And then to kind of broaden the view, each one of these would be, this would be like a backbone, it would be a linear polymer, this would have a charge all along its entire length. It would collect materials, uh, solids, particulates all along the length of it. When you add little branches onto it, you are now increasing the effective surface area of the polymer to collect material off of it. Um, the powder version um, is most commonly used and what I represented with the day tank application. The emulsion uh, is a liquid form, is generally uh, based off of a mineral oil content. So there is some petroleum products that get involved in the use of emulsions. Uh, Cross-link polymers are very interesting. They have only two applications that I know of. One is in um, the use of centrifuge treatments, and the other is in the use of agricultural processes. They trap a lot of water, and they release it slowly into their environment. Um, so the cross-links has actually been very useful in the southwest for helping irrigation um, in crop fields. So when the whole process gets going, that's pretty much what it looks like inside the clarifier. Um, your flock starts to form large clumps that settle out, and then <clears throat> the clear water goes over the top. It is the, the sludge material at the bottom that gets drawn off for dewatering. So now here comes the question. The ultimate fate of the polymer, where does it go? 
Um, this was uh, a nice photograph that was taken showing nice green hills with nice long low sloping areas. Those are all reclaimed areas. Pretty much if all of the polymer is being contained within the flock material, then it's all being drawn out with the solids. I think a facility has a very strong incentive to dose those polymers such that there's no extra left in the water, especially if it's a closed loop system. A closed loop system will take any residual polymers that might be left in solution and put it back into their wash towers. Now they're drawing too much sand. They're pulling product out with it. And that's something they don't want to do. So they're going to want to dose that low enough so that they don't have that happening in their wash towers and clogging things up. But at the same time, they don't want to have it down so low that they can't separate the solids out. So for the most part, polymers are ending up in the, in the reclamation phase. So that leaves the question now is to determine whether or not these polymers degrade and move through the water system and into the groundwater table. Those are questions that are currently unanswered. So that kind of wraps up my discussion about process wash waters under the stormwater permit and what we kind of look at for uh, a facility and, and maintaining um, their process system. So I guess I'm available for questions. Questions, anyone? I've, I've got one. If we get, if a client gets permission to use the flock line, goes through all the appropriate permits, and then the local town says we don't want to have a flock line, who has authority on issuing the water? The state permit would it would be allowable under the state permit, but I think that if there are local provisions that would probably trump us, I I would I wouldn't be able to, to speak to the definity on that. Yeah, yeah, they can be more stringent, but not less. Go ahead. I got it. I got an idea as well. My impression would be that the local could be more stringent, they could be less stringent. So if we said they were okay, the local said we don't want to be using it, they probably do something. Yeah. What, what about the question though is what is authority? The DNR is supposed to have the authority of the waters of the state. Um, and they're supposed to be regulating the water of the state. So I, I guess that's where that's a little more direct portion of my question, um, where it comes from. Because if, the, if it's the waters of the state, that's under DNR's jurisdiction. Under what authority would the town have the authority to use the water? It's still under that under, especially at uh, it's groundwater down with the authority under Lake Eula. Now again, our authority over groundwater. So it, it, I don't know if there's an answer, uh, but that'd be a tough one. Yeah, I think that's a question for the attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> I know my opinion. <laughs> Brian Rackey back there, he may have a different opinion. <laughs> Brian, have you looked at that at all from a county's perspective? No, I, I, I have not. I do have a different question, though. Okay. And I guess just to answer, well, to respond to what you said, I, I, I have a feeling that's part of the non metallic mining process itself, but that's how it's regulated by the county or the town, whatever's regulating the non metallic mining there as opposed to uh, groundwater type of regulation. But the question I had is you indicated that what we don't know is is the what what happens to the, the polyacrylic lines that are they leaching into the groundwater. We don't know that. What if any efforts uh, is the DNR taking to study that to find that out? I, I know there's several um, plants in the end Tremble County that are, uh, you know, permitted to use flocculants or polyacrylamides, and actually, uh, what our county typically does is require uh, concrete bottoms of any settling ponds. But then there's no regulation really as to putting that those that waste material back in the reclamation process. Um, so it really isn't. 
we have the same question that when you pull it, is anybody studying this? Is anybody uh, doing anything to, to find this answer? Well, I'm going to speak mainly um, to the USDS, um, USDA side of things. Um, in trying to work with and learn more about polymers and polyacrylamides, um, I have managed to get some open communication going with the polymer manufacturing companies themselves. Um, they have conducted studies with the USDA. As I mentioned before, the cross-link polymers are being applied to farm fields, to crop fields, um, in, in an attempt to hold water in arid areas. So there has been a study in Southwest looking at whether or not polyacrylamides break down in ultraviolet radiation, whether or not they move through the groundwater table, and at that point, at what levels. Um, I can forward to you, if you get in touch with me after, the, after I'm done here, um, I can send you an email um, with the USDA study that was conducted. Um, pretty much it was, uh, it stayed within the top 18 inches of the, of the farmed areas. No residual acrylamides were found downstream or in groundwater test areas. And um, they found that there was no breakdown of polyacrylamides at that point. Um, and this was shared by the polymer manufacturing company, so you have to take that into consideration when you look at that. Another part of it is about six months ago, our store water coordinator, um, Jim Bertel Singh, sent out a, a request for study topics, uh, items for further study, and that topic came up. I believe that was prompted by the uh, University of Wisconsin. So I, I don't know if that's, yeah, I didn't get any updates, but I know that those studies were proposed. Um, so I guess stay tuned. did mention the studies that have been going on with Chippewa County, uh, their land conservation department with ministers in 135 had a number of their mines put down gradient monitoring wells uh, about 50 feet down gradient from their selling ponds and test specifically for acrylamide compounds and they've got two plus years of testing now and they have yet to see a detect in their analytical method. They had a little bit of trouble finding a lab that could do it but they're sending it to a lab out of California that the detect level is at the same level as the drinking water standards. So, uh, you know, I don't know if that says it conclusively, but there is some data out there that shows that, you know, that it appears at least the polymers that they're using are not contributing to groundwater pollution to film lines. And, and I think the industry and everyone's on the same page. The last thing anybody wants to do is contaminate any of the groundwater. It, it, and this is an area that I think we probably need more information on. And I think the Chippewa situation might be helpful 
Uh, and it'd be nice if we can get it on the DNR website and kind of use them to share some of the information to make sure that we, we have all the facts and they can form us too. Any other questions? If not, let's give her a hand.